So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Carling. I'm the Director of Professional Practice and Quality Assurance. And I'm Samita Joglakar. I'm the Audiology Advisor and Manager of Mentorship. And I'm Sarah chapman Jay. I'm Advisor for Speech Pathology, Professional Practice and Quality Assurance. And welcome to our um, webinar, our e-forum on evaluating capacity to consent. Now, we are going to um, very much enjoy your questions. Uh, we want mm. this to be very interactive, but we do have quite a lot to get through. Mm. So we're thinking that um, we will have questions at the end, but I see one question now. I just want to check that everything is okay. The volume is low. Uh, okay, okay, so mm. um, maybe if you wouldn't mind just, um, uh, trying to turn it up from your end, I am going to have a to see how our volume is at this end. So, um, all right, so I think we are showing quite well. So, um, but thank you for that. All right, so let's get going. So, we thought long and hard what we wanted to achieve today and we do appreciate that this is a very difficult area of practice there are a lot of great areas mm. yeah. we are here to help you with the legislation but there might be questions where we will have to get advice mm -hmm. as well yeah but we want you by the end of today to understand your patient's rights about consent and about appealing a finding of incapacity. We want you feel that you are able to advocate for the fair evaluation of capacity. And um, then we are actually going to spend some time actually going through the process of uh, evaluating capacity. And then we want you to know what you need to do if you determine a patient does not have mm. capacity. So yeah. quite a lot to get through. So, so first of all, why is this so important? I think what we really want to get over and what has really helped me in the past, it's, it's not our judgment over whether a person's actions or choices appear reasonable or will put them at risk, but really does that person have the ability to understand critical information mm. and appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of their decision. Mm. And if they do understand and appreciate, then it's, it's their autonomy, it's mm. their right to make that decision, even if we don't think it's reasonable or think it's increased risk. Mm. Now, we do have some resources mm. here for you, and these slides are going to be put up um, onto our website under events and e-forums, so you will be able to access them there. So, according to the Healthcare Consent Act, every competent individual in Ontario has the right to consent, not consent, or withdraw consent to treatment. They also have the right to decide whether they'll be admitted to long-term care and whether to accept personal assistance service. And we're just going to focus on these today. Yeah. Now, if an individual's ability to make one of these decisions is in doubt, that is when his or her capacity will be evaluated. Now, again, under the Healthcare Consent Act, both audiologists and speech language pathologists can evaluate capacity for treatment. I know you all know that, but you are one of the regulated health professionals to also evaluate capacity to admission to long-term care and for personal assistance service. So what is capacity? Mm -hmm. So the Healthcare Consent Act defines it as, if a person is able to understand information that is relevant to making a decision about 
your treatment, mm -hmm. about admission to long-term care or personal assistance service. It is only on that decision, okay? Can they understand the information for that decision? Mm -hmm. And then are they able to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of their decision or at times of their lack of decision. Now, what we want to draw your attention to is Castle Poe some years ago determined that consent is required for screening mm. and for assessment as well as for treatment. Mm. So um, it might be that you are evaluating capacity to consent to assessment mm -hmm. or to treatment. Mm. So let's have a look at the evaluation. Now, under the legislation, it is a dichotomous decision. That is, someone either has capacity or does not have capacity. There isn't a decision that can be made to, I think, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. or, or maybe. It's, it's got to be either one or the other. And it's quite easy to decide definitely if they do or definitely if they don't, but there is a gray area. Mm -hmm. And this is what causes us the most concerns. Mm -hmm. And in this gray area, this is why it's so important that we have some um, objective evaluation of capacity mm -hmm. to overcome um, the issues in this gray area. So as we said earlier, and also bear with us because we're going to say it many times, mm. capacity evaluation is decision based. It's just for your decision. There is no really such thing as global capacity or incapacity. It's all decision based. Mm. Now, the lawyers like to call it um, that the evaluation would be done by a semi structured interview. Also, they call it a functional inquiry. But in essence, you are determining capacity through conversation. And of course, if someone has a communication barrier, and in that we're thinking of communication, we're thinking of hearing barrier, sensory barriers, mm -hmm. other barriers. Visual, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of potential barriers. Yeah, yeah. and we will be talking about that mm -hmm. a little bit later. Yeah. But these barriers serve to increase the gray area. Mm -hmm. So this whole process um, becomes incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, maybe you can take us through the first scenario. Yeah, okay. So we, um, we're going to start with a situation in the hospital, a common one, I would say. We have a patient here who is Errol. He's been referred to you as the speech pathologist for a swallowing assessment. And before you go in, you do a chart review. You're going to check up on medical history, any um, information that's gonna help you with your assessment. When you're looking at the chart, you actually notice that the physio, the OT, and the dietitians found Errol lacking in capacity to make a decision. All of them did contact Errol's substitute decision maker to get consent for treatment. So this is where we're going to engage with all of you, and we would like to know what you believe would be the next step. Would it be number one? that you would contact Errol's substitute decision maker to get consent for the swallowing assessment? Would it be number two that you speak to the charge nurse to see what Errol understands? Mm -hmm. Or would it be number three that you talk to Errol and you see if he understands the swallowing assessment and appreciates the consequences of his decision? So I'm going to open up the polls. So um, just bear with me. Um, here they are. I'm going to pull down the first one and launch it. And we can see um, the responses mm, yeah. coming in. Thank you. Um, at the moment, it seems to be about 20-80, 20% for contacting the substitute decision maker 
and 80% for talking uh, to Errol, number three. Okay, so I am actually going to close that and share it with you. And 93% said, talk to Errol and see if he understands the swallowing assessment. So, Sarah. Yeah, so thank you, because that would be the answer. Number three, talk to Errol. And you are going to find out if he understands the swallowing assessment and appreciates the consequences of his decision. So, Samida, why is this so important? Well, this is important because we wanted to talk about the presumption of, of mm. capacity. So a person is presumed to be capable with respect to treatment, admission to a care facility, and personal assistance services. Mm. And the exception to this would be if you have reasonable grounds to believe that the patient is not capable to make such a decision. So the onus, as Alex mentioned earlier, the onus is on the SLP as the mm. evaluator in this case mm. to demonstrate that a patient lacks capacity, not on Errol, the patient, mm. to demonstrate mm. his own capacity. And, and this is quite a nuanced statement, but really important. It puts the responsibility onto us it does. as the regulated yeah, health professional <clears throat> um, to determine if he does or does not, you know, and, and, mm. and remove some of the responsibility mm. from Errol or That's your right. patient. Mm. That's right. So um, continuing with this idea of presuming capacity, mm. um, as the regulated healthcare professional, it's your obligation to determine if a patient has capacity to consent to your assessment, your mm. particular assessment. Um, so in this case, I think it was mentioned that the OTs and the physios had found that Errol was lacking in his capacity. That was their finding. Mm. But for you, it doesn't matter what those other professionals found. Yeah. Your assessment as an SLP is a new, different health decision that Errol is making. Mm -hmm. So actually, in this scenario, what happens is the SLP, through the conversation with Errol, actually finds that he does have capacity and he understands what is involved with the swallowing mm -hmm. assessment and he understands the consequences of the assessment. Excellent. Yeah. I would just like to apologize to everyone. I didn't hide the um, results of the polling. I now know I have to do that. Oh, OK, thank right. you, Alex. <laughs> so okay. let's, um, won't be happening the next time. Hopefully not. OK, so OK, moving on with the same scenario. Now you're at the hospital rounds with the team and they actually are surprised that you did find Errol to have capacity for that decision, healthcare decision. The OT reports that Errol scored low on the Montreal cognitive assessment and other members of the team share concerns about his cognitive abilities when they've been observing Errol. So given this new information, what would you do next? Number one, would you advocate for Errol with the team? explain that he has understood, he did appreciate what your assessment and treatment plan means. Would you, number two, say nothing? You have determined Errol has capacity to consent to your assessment and treatment, and that's your decision. Or number three, after the team meeting, contact Errol's substitute decision maker to get consent for the treatment plan. Okay, so let's now go to our poll. and. Um, what would you do next? Yep. And I'm going to launch it. Mm -hmm. So the poll is open now. So um, this is this is interesting. Mm -hmm. We're getting some diverse mm -hmm. um, uh, results. Yeah. The majority are with number one advocating for Errol, but we still have some. Um, you know, saying nothing and uh, contacting the substitute decision maker. Mm -hmm. So we'll just yep. close that poll and share the results with you. And now I'm going to hide those results. <laughs> I've learned what to do and let us 
Move so we on. are going to find out. What would you do next? You would. You would advocate for Errol with the team. You would explain that he did understand and he did appreciate what it meant um, about the assessment and treatment plan. Right. So mm. this is interesting. Um, so the point that we want to get across here with what's happened in the scenario with Errol mm. is that cognitive testing does not equate to the patient's capacity to consent to the evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, so some healthcare professionals maybe who are less familiar with the legal requirements of uh, evaluating capacity, they might resort to formal tests that measure cognition and memory. Mm -hmm. I think in this case, it was the Montreal Cognitive mm -hmm. Assessment. Mm -hmm. But tests of cognition and memory do not evaluate a person's capacity, which is what we're talking about mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And that's their ability to understand uh, the information regarding your assessment or treatment mm. and their ability to appreciate the consequences of their decision. Mm. So cognitive tests don't measure that and they don't measure the patient's decision-making skills either. Absolutely. Mm. So Errol may have cognitive issues. And, and that information could be helpful and interesting yes. and informative. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it might be true. He might have trouble with more complex tasks, like may maybe managing his own finances. Mm. But he was able to understand and appreciate the decision at hand mm. that the SLP explained to participate in the swallowing assessment. He yeah. did understand that. Yeah. Um, so again, always assume capacity of the patient to consent mm. to a new healthcare decision. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the speech pathologist is following up again. Um, they've done the swallowing assessment and the recommendations include a dysphagia puree diet with moderately thick liquids and explaining it with er Errol and he's in full agreement to the diet texture. Except it's <laughs> now the next morning, he had some supper, he had breakfast and you are being contacted by the charge nurse who who says that Errol is refusing to eat and he would like a regular diet. I guess he's now found out what a dysphagia puree diet is yes. and seen it for real. Yeah. So you are now going to reassess Errol. You're going to request a referral and do a video fluoroscopic swallowing assessment. And from that test, the results are showing that barium has entered the airway. So now we know he is at risk for aspiration. At this point, Errol is refusing to consent to the proposed treatment plan. He does not want the dysphagia puree diet. He now wants to eat regular food. You explain in full the assessment results. You talk about the risks, the consequences, pros and cons of eating a regular diet and the reason why you have recommended that specific diet texture for him. What is your next step now? Are you going to number one? Uh, the team were correct. Errol does not have capacity. Contact Errol's substitute decision maker to get consent for the treatment plan. Or number two, are you going to talk to Errol and evaluate if he understands and appreciates the consequences of his decision to not consent to your plan? Or number three, are you gonna keep your proposed tr treatment plan? You are the professional and the treatment plan is in Errol's best interest. So let us pull down one, two, three mm. and launch the poll. Excellent. Collecting responses, <clears throat> looking good. So at this moment in time, uh, everyone is selecting number two. Just Looks give like you... People are thinking. 19%, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll mm -hmm. give you just a moment more to decide. And thank you, we'll close and share the results with you. And 94% mm. are saying that, um, mm -hmm. talk to Errol. Mm -hmm. 
so Sarah, let's, uh, yeah. So I'm very happy to hear this information <laughs> as well, because yes, your next step would be to talk to Errol and evaluate if he understands and appreciates the consequences of his decision to not consent to your plan. Mm -hmm. Sunita? So yeah, so another interesting um, mm. point to discuss here. Mm. So safety and best interest do not override autonomy. Mm. And a competent person's right to decide not to consent takes legal precedence over best interest. Mm. Um, so Errol, in this case, he's making a decision that may not be in his best interests um, or that may even be unsafe for him. Mm. However, if he understands the information and appreciates the consequences, then he has the right to make that decision. Yeah, absolutely. So it's what's interesting is that, you know, you may not agree. I think, Alex, you said that mm. earlier that mm. we may not agree with what the patient has decided. Mm, mm. And so that might make you feel very strongly, mm, you know, mm, that mm, uh, mm. I, I don't agree with what this patient mm. has decided, but it's very important to understand in this case that if they have the capacity, mm. then they have the right to make a decision that maybe we don't mm. agree with. Absolutely. And they appreciate the consequences. Abs yes. And they appreciate the consequences, decision. yes. Yeah. So unless there is clear and compelling evidence of impaired ability to understand and appreciate, the assessor, in this case the SLP, mm. cannot use a finding of incapacity as a means to manage risk. And I think this is a very important quote here from the Ministry of the Attorney General. And I would say we shouldn't be you know, evaluating and finding um, incapacity as a means to manage hospital admissions, hospital mm. discharges, etc. There's always a great deal of pressure on on uh, mm. regulated health professionals. Mm. Sarah, you work in a hospital. Yeah, well, but also remembering um, it's patient-centered care. Absolutely. So, you know, this is Yes. Always, they're you know they're understanding the full implications. Yes. They're appreciating the decisions yeah. they're making. And sometimes so. the advocacy is is um, having those difficult conversations with other regulated health professionals, mm. as we saw in an earlier scenario, mm. to mm. say no, he does understand and he mm. does appreciate, mm. and this is his decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now I am going to quickly go and have a look at our questions. Mm. Um, oh yes, thank you about the sharing of the poll, that was good. Mm -hmm. um, right, and the rest of the questions we will come to you uh, at the end. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, let us now go on to our second scenario. We are definitely on Mm. on track for a good amount of question yep. time yep. at the end Excellent. yeah so sure. samida okay so i'm i'm starting us off with scenario two which is about mrs kumar so mrs kumar is a patient you have seen for eight years um, for hearing loss mm. and she has an appointment with you she is only wearing one of her hearing aids and doesn't know where the other one is and you ask her a number of questions, but her answers are inconsistent. And because mm. you've been working with her for eight years, you know that this is new behavior for Mrs. Mm. Kumar. So really what, what it comes down to is Mrs. Kumar needs to purchase a replacement hearing aid, but you are unsure how to proceed in this case. Mm. So with consent, you call Mrs. Kumar's daughter, who admits that her mother is more forgetful these days. However, at times she does seem totally with it. So mm. she seems to fluctuate. Mm. Um, so Mrs. Kumar understands that she is here for a hearing test. You get consent and you proceed with the assessment and she is compliant. So what is your next step? Will you talk to Mrs. Kumar and determine if she has capacity to decide whether to purchase a replacement hearing aid or because her memory seems to fluctuate, will you discuss the purchase of the hearing aid with her daughter and ask her to consent on her mother's behalf? Or number three, will you adjust her current hearing aid and call Mrs. Kumar's family physician for advice? Excellent. So let's mm. go to um, this uh, next. Yep. 
and I'll launch that one. So the poll is open. We'll just give you time. I'm just going to have a quick sip of water while that happens. Yeah. It's looking pretty unanimous so far. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm. So we'll um, close the polling now. And we'll share the results with you. And 95% are saying to talk to Mrs. Kumar. And uh, just a couple are, are wondering whether they should talk to the daughter. Mm -hmm. So let me hide that poll. <laughs> and yes so number one is correct so talking to mrs kumar uh, would be what you would want to do in this case and determine if she has capacity to decide to purchase a replacement hearing aid so as we said many times <laughs> capacity to mm. consent is decision based mm. You are evaluating capacity only for the decision at hand. Yes, you know she came in with only one aid. It's a mystery. Mm. Um, you have heard that she is forgetful from the daughter, but you are evaluating Mrs. Kumar at this moment in time only for that one decision about a replacement aid. Yeah. Does she understand the need for and the benefit for, of a replacement hearing aid? Mm -hmm. Does she appreciate the consequences of purchasing that? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it costs a, a fair amount of money mm -hmm. or not purchasing a replacement, in which case she's only going to depend on the one aid. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of things uh, to think about, but really hone your thinking mm -hmm. to just this understand and appreciate the decision at hand mm. so the uh, a lot of people do talk to us don't they uh, uh, about fluctuating capacity and mm -hmm. it is a worry mm -hmm. and the it does it is addressed in the healthcare consent act they do recognize that a person may be incapable with respect to some treatments mm. but capable in respect to others. Mm -hmm. It also um, realizes that capacity can depend on time in so mm -hmm. much as someone can be found incapable at one time, yeah. but yeah. capable at another. Mm -hmm. We're so it always, can fluctuate. It can fluctuate, mm -hmm. but you should always go with the decision made when they are capable. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it might mean that you have to maybe wait um, for a, a period of time uh, until that patient, you were talking about um, patients with delirium. Right, so it's, a, so it's not, yeah, it's um, a fixed time. Yes. It wouldn't be long lasting. No, absolutely. Yeah. So if you mm -hmm. can wait, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, uh, for a fair yeah. evaluation of capacity, mm -hmm. you should really do so. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, in our scenario here, Mrs. Kumar has had a severe stroke and is admitted to Metro General Hospital. So at this point, she is now being referred for speech pathology services. When she's medically stable, the team are proposing to her and the family that Mrs. Kumar be placed in a long-term care facility. She's had some extensive um, well, it's, it's been the a stroke, large effect of the stroke, mm -hmm. absolutely. So this is where you do want to be a part of the capacity evaluation process for admission to long-term care, which you mentioned earlier, mm. the reason, the times when you would be mm. involved potentially. This time it's because Mrs. Kumar has a significant aphasia as well as still her hearing loss. Right. Yes. So what is gonna be your next step here? Number one, educate the case manager, carrying out the capacity evaluation regarding best ways to communicate, what supports to put in place for Mrs. Kumar. Number two, advocate that you be present 
during the case manager's capacity evaluation to help ensure sufficient understanding and expressive communication, a way for her to get her message across. Or number three, advocate that you carry out the capacity evaluation as you are the most appropriate professional given her communication and hearing barriers. Excellent, mm. so let's go to our um, poll, pulling down the next one and I'm launching it. Mm -hmm. Poll is open. My turn to have a sip of water while yes. we're collecting responses. Yeah. And there's a lot of deliberation about this, which yeah. is great to mm. see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, more of a mix on this yes, one. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So we'll. Uh, close the poll and mm. share it with you mm -hmm. and so uh, different results yes. this time a bit of a range still predominantly number two but we have also number one and three as options as well yep. excellent so i'm going Thank to hide you. those mm. and okay well alex <laughs> and the members <laughs> So I do feel we um, we wanted you to consider all these options and still we really want you to consider all of these possibilities. Yes, according to the situation you find yourself Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, and each one's going to be unique. So you're yeah. going to obviously um, you know, fit it with yes. the, the situation. So we're considering all of them. Number three, advocate that you carry out the capacity evaluation as you are the most appropriate professional, if you feel you have the confidence, the skills, mm. you understand the communication barriers the most, the hearing difficulties, uh, you're, you have ways to support this person, Mrs. Kumar, so you can do that. Yes, mm. and, and really we feel mm. that this is incredibly important, mm. that, that in this situation you are probably the most appropriate uh, regulated health professional to do this capacity evaluation. But as Sarah will say, yeah. if you can't. And if you can't, um, certainly you're gonna advocate that you be present, that you are part of that capacity evaluation. It might be the case manager, it might be a discharge planner, it might be a social worker. You know, every mm. you're all in different situations out there. So whoever is um, taking that role, so that you are still there to advocate for the patient, to help ensure that understanding and ability to get their message across mm -hmm. is being addressed. Definitely. And, hang on, sorry. At the very least, mm -hmm. we are saying um, number one would be to educate the case manager, carrying out the capacity evaluation regarding how to best communicate with Mrs. Kumar. Yeah, and absolutely. to overcome any of those barriers that she does have. Mm -hmm. So you are going to evaluate capacity, Mrs. Kumar or any of mm -hmm. your other patients. So let's really think about how you set about this process. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of preparation that you have to think about. Mm -hmm. First of all, carry out a decision analysis really consider what are the significant components of this decision. With Errol, of course, it would be a swallowing assessment mm. or following a, a, mm. a, a, treatment, a, a treatment plan action. of of a particular mm. diet. Mm. So you're really going to think, what are the significant components of this decision that Mrs. Kumar, Errol or whomever is going to make? So now you've you, you've thought it out, you're, you've written it down. I mean, with mm. long-term care, it's the fact that she won't be going home, mm -hmm. that she will be going, um, but that there will be nursing care there to help her, right. um, et cetera. So now you've got those components, you've got to think about how are you going to ensure that the patient understands those components. Mm. And this is again, when you're doing a lot of preparation, mm. there are some resources out there such as, 
um, the communication aid to capacity evaluation or case mm -hmm. and we do have a link to that yeah but gathering together everything you need to help Mrs Kumar or Errol communicate that yeah. they can understand. And, um, sorry, Alex, I'd add also in our, again, a resource, the Obtaining Consent for Services. At the end, we talked about options as well, some mm -hmm. how to facilitate excellent. as well. Consent. Excellent. Another this resource. Is yes, and this, yeah. is, this is case. Yeah. Excellent. So then you have to, um, figure out how are you going to ensure that they appreciate the consequences of their decision. This is a little bit more tricky mm. than um, understanding. So it's really getting that message in, getting the message out and, and finding out whether they really appreciate um, the, the consequences of their decision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, um, let's take um, Mrs. Kumar. Maybe she says she doesn't want to go to long-term care. She wants to go home. Mm -hmm. So you would then, you know her decision now. She wants mm -hmm. to go home. But how are you going to measure the appreciate? You can ask her questions. How are you going to get in and out of the bathtub? Mm -hmm. How are you going to... Um, phone someone yeah um if you need some if how are you going emergency. to cook if there's an yeah. emergency mm. so you can have all of these questions ready mm. to evaluate right. the appreciation of the consequences of their decision right and then all of these when you're evaluating capacity to consent this is significant. Mm -hmm. So you are going to have to find a way that you can verify that they both understand and appreciate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of good preparation. And then you're going to think about the barriers to the fair uh, evaluation of capacity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're communication specialists. We're going to be thinking of communication hearing. We're also, uh, those working in hospitals are very aware of visual deficits. Yeah. You're working with a team. So you're very aware of really yes. all the possible yes. barriers happening. Yeah. Medical information is complex and uh, that can be a barrier in itself. Sometimes people are being asked um, to make decisions on very little information. So make sure you've got all of the information there. Um, is English or French as a second language or subsequent language being spoken or written? And, and that must be considered. The actual diagnosis can have an effect on capacity evaluation. I'm thinking of something like Parkinson's mm. disease, mm -hmm. where you have periods where you're on, ergo you have periods when you're off, mm. um, and the medication side effects. I mean, you want mm. to assess, you want to overcome the barrier, you want to a fair evaluation. So assess them when they are benefiting from their medication the most. Yeah. Hopefully when they're at their optimum. Absolutely. In every area. Alert, Absolutely. Yeah. Aware, yeah. So now they're at their optimum, we've mm. got to think about all of the distractions. Mm. Their hospitals, etc., are, are noisy, busy places with mm. many distractions. Mm. And of course, Samida pain is mm. an incredible mm. distraction. I mean, mm. we know from maybe toothache or migraine migraine or mm. something. Yeah. And mm. fatigue. Mm -hmm. and and also how you're feeling your affect are you anxious depressed mm -hmm. are you stressed mm -hmm. that's going to affect your recall of information mm -hmm. um yeah. and we've talked about fluctuating cognition mm -hmm. and also hunger and thirst i mean mm -hmm. if they are on a modified diet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all can, they can think about is that piece of pizza or, or that they they want to glass of water glass they want to chug down yeah. i have to say i've definitely seen when in the time that i worked in a in a hospital that someone who is being caught at a time when they're just not at their best mm. you know they're in a lot of mm. pain they're very tired mm. they haven't eaten mm. um and i also think because slps and audiologists know about communication and the importance of being able to hear and communicate mm. effectively it's really important to ha be a part of this and yeah. to educate, yes. you know, collaborate with other professionals yes. because they may not know, you know, background noise yeah. is really terrible mm. for someone with hearing loss yeah. when they're trying to understand yeah. information. Absolutely. And I have seen patients be um, identified as like 
they are not with it mm. and it's just because they they can't they hear. Even mm. can't yeah. hear yeah yeah if yeah. they could hear yeah. they could participate yeah. but they simply can't hear yeah. and so they're being labeled as not understanding yes, yes, and yeah, so that's yeah. difficult and not responding yeah. so managing the barriers yeah. yes absolutely mm. and then there are the barriers of culture decision making mm. styles um mm. we have to respect uh those mm. and then evaluate a bias um mm. there yeah. is such a thing we isn't there i think we need it. to challenge yeah. all of our biases very good research on evaluation of capacity on people in wheelchairs versus people out of wheelchairs chairs and mm. more people are considered lacking in capacity the research mm. results showed um if mm. they're in wheelchairs so that shows bias mm. but also even invisible barriers right just you're saying somebody doesn't know you don't hear or you can't see or exactly yeah, yeah. that's exactly. also a fact yeah yes invisible yeah. barriers mm. and then of course your skill and confidence so mm. practice practice with each other mm. many sure. many times mm. Um, so moving on, so you're managing your um, uh, those barriers for the fair evaluation of capacity. And then as we've said, you have to walk in presuming capacity in this um, evaluation. The onus, as um, uh, Sunita said earlier, is on you, on us as evaluators mm. to demonstrate someone lacks capacity that puts the responsibility onto us. It's not on the adult to demonstrate capacity. Mm. And again, it's nuanced, but I think mm. it's very important. Mm. We should be informing the patient um, that their capacity um, is going to be evaluated. You know, we can say, uh, let's say of long-term care. Mm. You know, we're going to have a conversation <clears throat> about long-term care. Mm. I think you can decide that's presumption of capacity but i have to check so we're going to have a conversation going to ask you some questions to see if you can decide if you do understand mm -hmm. okay that's mm -hmm. only fair mm -hmm. and something called rights advice i'm going it is here but sarah is going to um or is it samida one of them is going to look at it in more <laughs> detail one of us yeah, yeah. One of us. <laughs> right but explaining the consequences of a finding of incapacity that you will be going to the substitute decision maker for, for that decision and that they can appeal or review that the terms are synonymous. Um, and if they want to appeal, you will help them. Mm. Obviously, you, can, uh, you must allow your patient to ask questions as you're going mm. through and you must provide them information. Mm -hmm. So they might want more information about their substitute decision maker. So you mm -hmm. can, um, we've got a link to the hierarchy. And Sarah, mm -hmm. you were saying it's always the highest. There's, yeah, there is the hierarchy. So you're always going to go to the highest yes. um, person on that substitute yeah. decision yeah. maker list. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there is uh, information on the consent and capacity board in the office of the public guardian mm -hmm. and trustee in case. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is um, presented in a communicatively accessible yes. um, format. Yeah. Now, this is an interesting one, seeking out consent to evaluate. Um, there is some legislation out there, some common law, mm. uh, where Justice Quinn said that um, you should inform the person being evaluated and should not continue with the evaluation if they refuse, refuse mm. consent. Mm. Now, it could be that it's just bad timing and that mm. you come back later mm -hmm. and they're mm. more uh, willing right. to right. answer your questions. Yeah. Also in the past, I have told patients, look, this is in your best interests. Mm. This is your opportunity to show that you do understand and that you can make this decision mm. because you do appreciate the consequences as well. Mm. Mm. Now, if it really is difficult, then um, we would suggest that you call uh, the Consent and Capacity Board. So then, as you're going through all of your preparation about the decision analysis and, and the decision and helping them to understand and to appreciate, then you are going to determine mm. if they do understand, mm. if they do appreciate, yeah. mm -hmm. in other words, they have capacity. If you're unsure, you can reassess later, maybe mm. with a colleague, mm -hmm. and document. 
document the results, but document your evidence that supports your decision as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, I believe we're on to um, yes. Samida, mm -hmm. and we do have to move fairly yes, okay. judiciously through this. <laughs> so, in this, uh, so going back to Mrs. Kumar, so you have completed your capacity evaluation following all of the steps, Alex, that you just reviewed mm. um, for her admission to long-term care. You analyzed the decision, supported her conversation, and reduced the barriers to ensure a fair evaluation of her capacity. And in this case, you found that she did not understand the relevant information and she did not appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of her decision. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Kumar <clears throat> does not have capacity um, to consent to admission to a long-term care facility. So what is your next step? Will you inform the case manager who will manage the long-term care admission? Mm -hmm. Will you inform Mrs. Kumar's daughter, who is the substitute decision maker, and let her make the decision for her mother? Mm -hmm. Or will you immediately tell Mrs. Kumar your finding and explain the appeal process and offer to help with the appeal? So let's launch the poll. Mm -hmm. So interesting so far, we're getting a, a mixture of uh, responses mm -hmm. on um, informing Mrs. Kumar's daughter um, and telling Mrs. Kumar, so number two and three. Okay, so mm -hmm. we are actually going to close the poll and share the results with you. Mm -hmm. And 60% are saying um, number three. And uh, then the rest are for number two and one or two for number one. So. And the answer is number three. So mm -hmm. immediately tell Mrs. Kumar your finding. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, explain the appeal process and offer to help. And so this is the part about rights right. advice. So Alex, you talked about giving mm -hmm. the patient rights advice. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you would be um, talking to Mrs. Kumar and informing her why she is incapable of consenting to the long-term care admission decision. And you would be telling her that you will contact her daughter um, who will make the decision on her behalf and you'll be informing Mrs. Kumar about her right to a review of your finding of incapacity to make to consent. And a, a, a review and appeal is synonymous. So review uh, and appeal. Yeah. 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 Um, so following your capacity evaluation and providing the rights advice that we just described, mm -hmm. you will continue to collaborate with Mrs. Kumar, her family, and the healthcare team. Um, and this is very important. This is a point we wanted to stress because just because Mrs. Kumar was found to not have capacity for that decision about long-term care admission, mm, yeah. it doesn't mean that you stop talking to her. No. You, you keep know? engaging her. Yeah. She's involved still. Yeah. In the exactly. Process. You want to keep her. That's yes. patient-centered. Yes. Yeah. As you were describing, yes. that's patient-centered care. Yeah. So you don't stop talking no. to Mrs. Kumar. You keep her as in, you know, involved as as much as possible. Mm. Oh, do you? Okay, yeah. so right. now what we're going to do, and Sarah's going to take us through it, is supposing Mrs. Kumar said she did want your decision of a finding of incapacity reviewed or appealed. Okay, so she has decided to appeal it. So um, basically the review has to be completed before, any, before she's moved to long-term yeah. care. Uh, you would inform the patient that you or probably someone else in the healthcare team will help them to contact the Con Consent and Capacity Board. There is a, a time frame. So within one week, the Com Consent and Capacity Board um, would review and receive the application. The board is going to hear the appeal. They will interview Mrs. Kumar, the patient, the healthcare team, and they're going to review 
all the evidence, the documentation in the health records. And I think what's quite important is the Consent and Capacity Board actually come to where the patient is. Right. So it could be the hospital, right. the home, long-term yes. care, any, anywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the patient's lawyer, if they have one, will also submit evidence and provide advice to the patient. And then the board decides if the patient has capacity to consent to a decision. Could, if, it was, if it was related to treatment, it was the treatment. In this case, in our scenario, it's admission to long-term care. Okay. And I think a final wrap-up message here is, yes, we acknowledge capacity evaluation is not the easiest of processes to either understand or participate in, but this is a role that as audiologists and speech pathologists is expected of us. Mm -hmm. We want everyone to keep informed, to be aware of the legislation uh, about capacity, evaluation, assessment, and patients' rights, very important want you to feel comfortable carrying out capacity evaluations. You gave an example, do some practice, mm, yeah. try it with each other. Um, we want you to be advocates, to be part of the capacity evaluation process in any setting that you might be in. And key, collaborating with other professionals in the process. And also your role to be an advocate, to educate others on what, what supports there are to help with communication, to help with hearing. Yeah. And then we also want you to engage with the other team members if they have supports in terms any sort of accessible technology to help with vision, with you know other areas that we have not considered maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. anything Excellent. else to add there? So now we will move to your questions and I'm just bringing up the question box. Um, Okay, so let's start. Um, right, some, uh, yes, there will be a copy of the slides yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Um, and stop sharing the poll, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, how does Errol express that he understands the issue at hand and the consequences of his decisions? So that would be something that you would work um, work on and do preparation. You would make sure that he understood about the swallowing. You can do a lot of um, uh, sort using of actions, supports. using yeah. supports, yeah. whether it is actions, whether it is pictures, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Um, actually doing some acting out of coughing, if something's going the wrong way, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So really using your good skills. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now I'm just going to scroll down. I think the tool that you referenced case um, is, is an example, right, of where the yeah. patient can point to pictures. Yes, yeah. you to... give them forced choices, options, okay, yeah. should we do this or yes. this? So if they're not this. able to speak, then yes. they, that's yeah. an example of a tool of how yeah. Errol could have expressed that, is yes. that he could point to a picture, you know, maybe nod yeah. his head yes or yeah. no, or, yeah. yeah. So evaluating, um, the, the, we, we've got a question about fluctuating capacity. Mm. So, um, and I think we kind of addressed that late because just looking at the time yes, of the question, yes, too. yes, yeah. yes. So, um, hopefully, we understand that, yeah, yeah, it can fluctuate. We yeah. want to try and find the optimum time, especially if you're aware Absolutely. medication yeah. timing, yes, if there's delirium, if there's um, find him at his best, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, what responsibility do we have when the team feels the patient? has capacity to make decisions, mm. but we feel his communication and cognitive deficits are so profound and it does not even have a reliable yes, no response mm. that that really um, is, is their capacity evaluation and determination, um, is it um, realistic? So this is what we would do, a very, very good communication, interprofessional communication, mm. um, uh, explaining to them, trying to determine, does he have a positive, uh, does he have a reliable yes, no? Mm. Is it pointing to things or what have you? Mm. Or maybe doing some education of the team that, you know, uh, some people can be very skilled at um, trying to answer questions 
and thinking those are the answers people want to hear mm. so then do your verification definitely need the verifying so maybe mm. asking a question that requires a positive response mm. and then reframing that question mm. requiring a negative response and recalling that capacity is not static it's it, it can keep changing even the ability to understand yes no questions yeah, right especially at the acute stage can right. change so i do want to get mm. do you mind if we get onto this sure or? yeah mm. well she i think the, there was also a suggestion in that question that the slp's contribution is not valued by the team yeah and so if that's the case then i mean i don't think that means you stop trying no, you know, you keep no. trying to collaborate with your yeah. colleagues and explain why your knowledge and skills are important for this patient mm. in this scenario. Because I think there was that suggestion that mm. it's not valued by the, mm. that it may not be valued by the team, but then that's just, mm. it's, right. yeah. Yes. But you yeah. keep trying because it is valuable, you know, SLPs yes. and mm. audiologists do have valuable contributions mm. to make okay um, um yeah we have to move past those okay well, yes it was technical yes issues. so there is a question about age and capacity evaluation and what if a younger person um wants to make a particular decision mm. in the legislation they don't talk about um uh being 18 or um anything like mm. that they predicate whether a, a, a youth um, a young person can um, make a decision and consent to a treatment or other predicated on can they understand the relevant information mm. and do they yeah. appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's move on. Um, yeah, so the presumption of capacity is regardless of age. Regardless right. of age. Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, OK, so someone is is saying that while they agree that at times SLPs might be or audiologists might be the most competent professional um, with some decisions, uh, maybe um, it would be better if um, someone else were present because they might have more information. If you feel that you do not have sufficient information about the decision in hand, for example, um, uh, admission to long-term care, mm -hmm. then that would be the time when you would work with maybe a case yeah. manager, et cetera. Yeah. Or it might be that, that you become very well um, versed or educated mm -hmm. in the decision at hand. Mm -hmm. But yes, absolutely. We're say, I think what we're trying to say is advocate to be part of the process either that you are the one doing the capacity evaluation, but maybe having the uh, social worker or case manager in the room with you, yeah. but you are doing it and they can say, ask this question, ask that question, mm. um, or um, they are actually doing the mm. evaluation while you're and supporting you're providing them. The support. yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah. Okay, what profession were you assuming the clinical was in Mrs. Kumar's case? Audiologist. Yes. Yes. Yeah, audiologist. Yeah. yeah. I think Actually, I was aware when in. that happened um, yeah. at the beginning, but maybe that became clear as, as the scenario went on. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Okay, if you're hearing in a hospital that um, only LINs of the professionals who can determine capacity related to long-term care admission, that might be a process that they want to um, uh, put in place, but under the legislation, you um, are one of the regulated healthcare professionals who can be involved in this case. And it might be a question where you're doing quite a bit of advocacy. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, certainly to be involved. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And, and I think the next part of the question is, if the patient has no communication at, uh, impairment, but has a cognitive impairment, again, we're looking at our scope of practice as yes. audiologists and speech pathologists. So mm -hmm. I think we're really coming in from that point of view. Yeah. So when we feel we have something to add and contribute, that's when we would take that role. Right. So again, we've had a question about pediatrics. So again, mm. um, there is no age um, 
mentioned in the Healthcare Consent Act, it's all predicated on the ability to understand and appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, on how this, uh, uh, okay, so parents um, consenting a substitute decision maker. So I believe maybe the question is, um, does the parent have capacity to um, make a decision on behalf of their child. Mm. Uh, this is a difficult situation, one where I think you would um, speak to your um, uh, colleagues. Um, uh, uh, you can uh, take that step, and if you really believe that someone does not have capacity to make a decision on someone else's behalf. Mm. I would also maybe in this situation call the Consent and Capacity Board. Um, okay, um, oh, I keep on doing that. I'm very sorry. All right. Um, we're going back to the first questions. There is, I do, I'm mindful of time. And yes, I do yeah. want to, while Alex is going down to the other questions, just remind you absolutely contact us through practice advice, yes, advice. Uh, with any additional questions that we have not been able to yeah. address during this. And um, we know, are webinar. definitely, part, uh, uh, to, just to reiterate, someone has said that um, only a trained capacity assessor um, can uh, uh, evaluate capacity for long-term care. No, uh, um, uh, we all can do it, okay? We are evaluators. Um, okay, so I think with the time, we'll end it here. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to look at the questions, we'll send them to us, we'll um, write some responses, and we'll send mm. them to everyone. Yeah. yeah, actually, I think this might be a situation with these, it might be good to have some frequently asked some questions, questions. Yes. that we develop yeah. following this yes. webinar. Yes, would be helpful. absolutely. Board so members. thank you. Yeah. So we'll do Excellent. that based on your feedback to us. Yes. So um, I'm now going to say um, thank you very much for joining us. We are going to say goodbye, and um, uh, we will be in contact. These slides will be up hopefully tomorrow or Monday yeah. um, and the recording will be as well. Mm -hmm. So I am going to now stop sharing and say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.